Overall, I feel like this was an underwhelming night one of WrestleMania. There were a few kind of issues with the show, I feel like. The crowd felt a little bit flat, a little bit quiet. Um, it was also balls fucking cold, apparently, in the arena. Everybody was freezing their asses off. So everything looked great for the entrances and whatnot, but when the ring, when the action started happening in the ring, you couldn't see any of the crowd, so you couldn't see them react. Then you combine that with the fact that they felt a little flat in terms of their enthusiasm. They felt kind of dead at times, and maybe it has to do with uh, being in an open air stadium, and you know, and the, and the sound just kind of you know just goes up and evaporates uh, away into the air. And maybe people in the arena didn't notice any difference at all, or didn't notice any problems. But at least on TV, watching it live, it didn't sound very good, and the crowd seemed a little flat, quiet, and dead through a lot of matches tonight and there was a couple of matches that I, I thought were kind of disappointing in terms of me wanting more out of them one of those matches was Jimmy and Jay you know the crowd just wasn't very vocal for it or at least we couldn't hear the crowd I don't know which one it is uh, but uh, it was just hard to to hear anything you know for that one and I was expecting a lot more a lot more drama to be honest with you but I still thought none of the matches were bad all of the matches were fine but none of them really stood out I wasn't disappointed with any of the outcomes really tonight in terms of my predictions I only got two matches wrong I got uh Jimmy and Jay wrong and I got the Santos and Ray tag wrong everything else I got right uh but overall it felt like when I was glancing at Twitter throughout the night when we were talking in the chat throughout the show it felt like most people were giving WrestleMania you know, underwhelming grade. So let me know what you think in the chat. Grade the show for me, A, B, C, or D, one through 10. What would you grade it? What would you rank it? What is your enthusiasm or excitement level going into tomorrow? Because now night two, the table is set. Seth Rollins is going into his championship match, probably a bit injured, not 100%, at least in kayfabe. And now Cody has got his bloodline rules stipulation tomorrow. And the story they're trying to tell you is that he's screwed and the reality is starting to sink in for Cody Rhodes. But as I've been saying since the beginning with this, knowing Cody Rhodes as a character, who we've become to who, who we've uh, come to know him to be based on the fact that he's not dumb. He's grown up in the business. He's very smart. He's not naive. We know what happened to him last year, falling victim to the numbers game bloodline, too much bloodline. So for Cody to go into this tag match purely believing, and he's going to he's gonna be hinging his night two main event against Roman Reigns, he's going to be hinging all of that on him and Seth Rollins. He's going to have that much confidence that he's just going to believe that they're going to be okay and they're going to win and it will be Cody and Roman one-on-one. -on -one. Does that sound like something that Cody Rhodes' character would do? He's desperate to finish his story. He got fucked out of it last year. He, the character, should be making contingency plans. Meaning, Cody, as a character, we the audience not seeing this, but Cody's character, while he's sitting on his bus, while he's at home, while he's fucking around with his kid, when he's banging Brandy, whenever, he comes to the realization that, hey, we could lose on night one. In the event that we do, Maybe Rollins fucks me over. Maybe Rollins loses. He might have all the confidence in the world in himself, but shit, anything can happen. The bloodline could interfere. Rock could pull some shit. I need to be prepared if we don't win because it would be silly just to be so confident that you don't make any alternate arrangements. So if we lose, that means it's bloodline rules. If we lose, that means Roman gets his whole family and anybody can run in on this thing. Well, it's not just bloodline rules for Roman. It's bloodline rules for me too says Cody. So you know what? Let's make some phone calls. Hey, Austin, put down the beer for a second and listen. Can you be at WrestleMania in case I need you? Get your, can you find a four-wheeler? Great, good. Bring yours. Does it have Austin 316 scribbled all over it? Awesome. Perfect. Does it have a beer cooler? That's what I'm looking for. Cool. So bring that to WrestleMania. Rikishi is probably going to get involved in my match. When he hops over the barricade, I need you to drive down and run his ass over. You got me? You know, who else can... Cody call or who else can Cody talk to? He might not need to talk to anybody. He just needs to hit up Jay. He just needs to hit up Sami Zayn. He may or may not have Seth Rollins help, but Jay and Sami are two big ones because they've been so heavily involved in the bloodline storyline over the past couple of years. So if they were to get involved on Cody's behalf and 
Seth Rollins, you know, maybe after he loses the title or perhaps retains it or drops it to Damian Priest or something, hobbles out there to try to help out as well. And maybe the one the one element they need to put them over the edge is, is a an appearance by Stone Cold Steve Austin, uh, which would be tremendous. But I also think, you know, maybe even Kevin Owens could run out there as well. Uh, you know, we know we're going to see Jimmy. We know we're going to see Solo. We know The Rock might fuck around with Cody's mom some more. Uh, I think Brandy could be out there to maybe bitch slap somebody. I think Dustin could make an appearance uh, if uh, Tony Khan gives him a green light there. Who knows? But I do think tomorrow is still set up pretty well for all of that. And I think Cody's character would be, he would may, be made to look very weak. You know, if Cody is sitting in on these creative meetings and they said, hey, Cody, you're going to go into WrestleMania tomorrow and, or, uh, you know, this year and you're going to lose in night one, then night two is going to be bloodline rules and you're going to fall victim to the, to the numbers game again and you're going to get beat. Wouldn't Cody be like, why would my character do that? Why would my character allow that to happen? Why wouldn't my character, who's a likable guy, who has friends, not have anything in place in case it's bloodline rules? After what happened to me last year, spiked in the neck, I'm going to just sit back and voluntarily let that happen again? Fuck that. I think that's all part of this. I think him losing here is part of him winning tomorrow. There's no way Cody Rhodes, who you know is basically the champion without the belt right now, is going to lose back-to-back night's main event of WrestleMania. It's not going to happen. And I don't often say that. I don't sit there and proclaim that I know and I speak facts and whatever. But what fucking universe can you envision Roman Reigns walking out of uh, WrestleMania with the belt in. That would just be insane. WWE tonight, by the way, you know, they also were kind of pushing this, this new era. They mentioned it a couple of times, this Renaissance era that apparently Cody is trademarked, not WWE. Triple H opened the show tonight, 24, less than 24 hours after Paul Heyman aggressively and vigorously put him over last night in the Hall of Fame. You know, which I think was a direct message to Vince McMahon that we're done with you and Triple H and Paul Levesque is our guy. And Triple H opened the show, welcomed us to WrestleMania and welcomed us to a new era. Well, part of that new era needs to be moving away from Roman Reigns. He's in the same position as his cousin, Yokozuna, going into WrestleMania 10. It was a long run for Yoko. That was a long year, man. He essentially had the belt a year. He dropped it at Mania 9, but won it right back at King of the Ring. But it felt like he had the belt for a year. So going into, you know, WrestleMania 10, what what was Vince saying all night long? We're ready to blast off into the next generation. You know, he just kept saying that over and over and over. And tonight we were hearing a lot of that from the announcers, from the Graves and Cole uh, and McAfee, three-man team that will be calling both nights of WrestleMania. They said that a lot. So Triple H coming out and kind of symbolically, you know, ushering in that new era, the 40th WrestleMania, you know, the the first 39 years are behind us. This is, you know, a new WWE. And it was kind of nice. You know, we still have to deal with the fallout. That Vince McMahon lawsuit ain't going away. There's still going to be some ugly stuff happening in the news regarding that, and perhaps even some more people held accountable. But in terms of Triple H's job and his position in the company, it seems pretty secure. We even had Stephanie by his side last night. And that all, I think, is tying into this kind of new era. Exactly. Smitty, good point. New signature intro, right? New signature intro for uh, WWE as well to open the show. So it definitely feels new. Kevin Dunn has finally gotten out of our fucking lives, and we've seen just a tremendous increase in the production value of WWE, their techniques, the things they're doing are great. I mean, it's just so refreshing. The fact that it took this long to get this done because Kevin Dunn was so goddamn fucking formulaic and every show felt the same, looked the same. Uh, Overall, I think tonight's WrestleMania 40 night one Saturday was a little bit underwhelming. We're going to talk about the results here in just a second. I don't have uh, a lot of detail on my notes because we were watching it and I wanted to hang out with you guys, but I do have the order of the matches and the show opened up with Becky Lynch versus Rhea Ripley. I really like this. Well, I should say the show opened up with Triple H coming down to the ring and welcoming welcoming us to WrestleMania 40 and a new era in WWE, which I really liked. That was uh, that was to signify this is it. This is the Paul Levesque era. Even last night in the Hall of Fame speech, Paul Heyman said that he's the first headliner in a class completely selected by Paul Levesque. I think that's awesome. I think that's awesome. All right, so the show opened up with the first match we got was Rhea Ripley versus Becky Lynch. I like this a lot. Becky got a special entrance there, reading some passages from her book, 
A lot of effects there. Her gear looked amazing. She looked like a big Budweiser can, but it kind of had uh, paragraphs from her book written on her gear and on her book or on her boots, I should say. She had great hair, great makeup. She looked like a million bucks. They did say that she has been battling or was battling strep throat all week and she has been sick. So she was a little bit, a little bit under the weather here. Rhea Ripley came out, I guess the band that sings her song sang her to the ring. So she was very much marking out over that. I don't like it when wrestlers sing the lyrics to their song when they're coming down to the ring. Rhea Ripley did, does it. Paige used to do it, but Rhea Ripley's so exquisitely amazing that I will give her a pass. Uh, and uh, she looked great, loved her gear, rocked down to the ring, you know, just rocking her ass off. And uh, this match was going to open the show. And I really wasn't feeling Becky Lynch winning here. It just felt like it would be better. Becky Lynch is already a, a highly decorated superstar. Winning the title here, I think it would do more for Rhea to retain than it would for Becky to win. Plus, I really want to see Rhea Ripley versus Bianca Belair next year at WrestleMania 41. I wouldn't even put it past WWE to have that match main event night two next year. The problem is if Rock and Roman is going to be next year, then that's going to be your night two main event. But if not, I might vote for uh, Rhea and Bianca to main event night two. And maybe Cody and Seth can main event night one for the championship. And Seth beats him for it. I'd be into that. So the match was okay. The match was good. Uh, of course, uh, you know, since I was doing a watch along, I wasn't writing down spots normally. If I'm doing a review, I'll write down some specifics in this match. Nothing I can remember off hand other than the fact that I didn't like the match. I thought it was good, but not quite as good as last year with Rhea Ripley and Charlotte, but a lot of near falls, finisher kickouts and whatnot. And Becky definitely put up a good fight, but in the end it was Rhea Ripley putting her down and beating her. And that made me very happy because I'm not really ready to end the run of mommy here, especially with her opponent being Becky Lynch. Becky will have an, a multiple, probably more world championships in her career, but here I felt like it wasn't time. I'm glad Rhea Ripley retained, and I was off to a really, really good start there. So that's two big WrestleManias in a row, beating Charlotte to win the title last year and here uh, defeating Becky Lynch to retain. Mm -hmm. Holding the belt for another year is a long time. It's a really long time. So Rhea Ripley being champion by the time we get to next year's WrestleMania, to me, would make her just a little bit too ripe, you know, just too ripe. You know, if she goes in to Mania next year holding the title for two years— Bianca wins the Rumble. It's going to be too obvious that Bianca's going to win. So they're going to have to do something like with Cody and Roman and, you know, take you on a windy road, maybe even turn Bianca a little bit, you know, maybe even do a double turn in the match where Bianca goes heel or something. I would love for Rhea Ripley to be the one to, to snap, snip off the, the braid of Bianca once she finally sheds that. So I feel like Rhea and Bianca, that's, that's your Warrior Hogan. That's your Cena Orton. That's your Rock Austin, that's your Brett Sean. It's those two in the women's division. So I would build that big WrestleMania match next year. But tonight was good to see Rhea Ripley retain. Uh, and I thought the match was good, uh, just not great. Just a really good match. Next up after that, we had the six-pack tag team ladder match for the undisputed tag team titles. Now on Raw this past Monday, they made reference to the fact that that all four titles need to be pulled down in order to win here. So that told us right away that they're going to separate out these titles. This is a really weird way to do the match. They didn't even hang all the belts together. They had them on two separate hooks. So this was basically an ununification match because the odds, if you're going to do the belts like that, the odds of two teams pulling them down are very high. And I'm like, this is way too obvious. I don't like it. I went on a long rant in my predictions and last Monday during the Raw review of why I don't want the tag team titles to be split back up. I think having two sets of tags is dumb. You should just have one. It makes the, it makes the division more exciting. It makes the division more important. It makes the belts more important. Plus, you can float you know, between brands and, and give us fresh matchups. I just see no downside whatsoever uh, to having one championship. But once they announced these rules, and then when we saw the two sets of belts hanging so far apart, that's confirmation. They're going to split these fucking things up. Now, how about me getting this right? In my predictions on Thursday, I said WWE's clearly setting up for two teams to pull down the belts. So I predicted that right. But then I was like, which two teams are pulling down the belts? I, I said it's going to be a Raw team and a SmackDown team. 
So I think Miz and R-Truth are pulling down the red ones, and Waller and Theory are pulling down the blue ones, and that's exactly what happened. So Judgment Day is no longer tag team champions. Both belts came down in the hands of separate teams, which might now lead to a match to unify them again, or Pierce and Aldis are just going to agree to each have tag team championships on their show, which is what I think they're doing here. Now, I'm still holding out hope that that story we heard about WWE screen testing new tag team championship belts are for these new belts here. Now that we have two teams holding titles, they're going to separate back out and they should be presented with new championships because we are entering a new era, right? Also, Triple H said this weekend that the WWE draft is probably about a month away, which is good to know because tomorrow, when Cody becomes world champion, undisputed champion, does that mean he's on SmackDown? Or does that mean the undisputed championship is on Raw? Could go either way, I guess. But I guess if Cody wins, you're technically going to have two champions on Raw. You're going to have to just by default move Cody to SmackDown or everybody just is working both shows until you do the draft in a few weeks and you figure it all out there. Don't know. But I think uh, based on the finish that we saw here, splitting up the tag team titles is what they're doing and I don't like it and it sucks. So we'll see how they rectify it. Awesome truth being, uh, I mean, I'm happy for our truth. That is one silver lining here is that our truth won a championship at WrestleMania. And I don't think he's ever won a match at WrestleMania. So not only did he win here, he won a championship. That's cool for him. Unfortunately though, I think it's probably going to be relatively short lived as who knows for all we know, the judgment day wins the titles back from them uh, on raw in two days, we will see. But now that Damian Priest is no longer tag team champion, he got his match over with in the second match of night one. So explain to me, like I'm stupid, like I'm five, what in the world would Damian Priest's motivation be to not attempt to cash in at WrestleMania? He had a bunch of, there was a point in tonight's main event where all four men were destroyed on the outside of the ring. Two. World champions, motionless. What the fuck are you doing? What are you doing? Eating a chicken pot pie? Get your ass out there, you fucking dumbass. What are you doing? So I think they're saving that for tomorrow, but Damian Priest didn't get hurt in the match. He's not injured. There's no storyline reason for him not to be lurking around with that briefcase. So he, he passed up tonight's opportunity. Fair enough. You got two more tomorrow. But if he doesn't turn up at all, what the hell? <laughs> you know, we're going to see him tomorrow. He's coming out. He is coming out. I'm, I'm as certain as of that as I am of Cody winning the title tomorrow night. I just hope Priest doesn't cash in on him. I need Priest cashing in and McIntyre and Seth. That's where the cash in needs to be. Punk is on commentary. He's going to be involved in this. He's going to fuck something up. And Priest is going to come down and capitalize on... That situation. That's what I'm banking on tomorrow because I do not want Damian Priest still holding the money in the bank by the time we get to Cody and Roman tomorrow night. That's going to make me a little nervous. So we will see. We will see. Uh, after that, we had Santos Escobar and Dominic taking on Rey Mysterio and Andrade. Now, this I had wrong as well. I thought for sure we would get Dominic pinning his father here to get uh, his win back from last year. Now, husband, husband, I'm sorry, father and son own WrestleMania victories over each other. I thought that would be good for the Mysterio family. I thought 100% that's what was going to happen, especially after last night on SmackDown when Carlito just happens to find Dragon Lee beaten up. And then he's like, it's Santos. Who else could it be? I'm like, it's probably you, you prick. And you're going to turn on Ray and Andrade in this match and help Santos and Dominic win. Carlito even came out with Ray and Andrade and the LWO. And that made me happy because I thought we were going to see him turn heel, but he never did. We just had the match and I don't even remember how the finish went or who. Oh yeah, I do. I remember. That's right. I think I know why they didn't do this finish. I think Dominic would have pinned Ray and the heels would have won here if WWE wouldn't have landed uh, Jason, uh, is it Kelsey? Is it Jason Kelsey or Travis? Kelsey, the Kelsey that plays for the Eagles, 
another guy that plays for the Eagles, hopped over the barricade in, in Philadelphia Eagles luchador masks, and they got in the ring and they helped uh, Rey Mysterio and Andrade uh, put down Dominic and Santos. And I think it was Andrade. I forgot who. I don't even remember who pinned who. I think Ray pinned Santos uh, for the win there with some help from the Philadelphia Eagles guys who then took off their shirts and were posing and Kelsey was going like that. It was pretty funny and it was good for the Philly crowd. Then we had Jimmy Uso versus Jay Uso. Jay had uh, Lil Wayne wrap him to the ring, so that was cool. And the match was fine and whatnot, but the crowd, it was just lacking the emotion you know, and I think just the, the crowd being darkened and not being able to see them, the the weather, the chilliness, you know, of it, you know, n- none of the wrestlers were really sweating in the ring because it was cold and it was windy, you know, so you didn't have, you know, the guys didn't look like they had been through a war, you know, where they're, you know, where they're on the, on their knees, you know, trading the, the desperation blows, you know, those type of spots that we like to see so much. We didn't get any of that, really. It was just... You know, it was just a match, a lot of super kicks, you know, a lot of kicks, a lot of splashes and whatnot. And the the finishing sequence was another thing that I didn't like. If if I was just hoping that Solo Sokoa would just come in and interfere and cost Jay the match, but Jay seemingly has Jimmy beat, right? And he's going in for that final kill, that super kick uh, death blow. And he goes to do it, and Jay is like begging him, please don't stop. I love you. Jay stops. You know, has a little bit of remorse. He, you know, Jimmy is kind of pleading with him to have some mercy on him. And Jay gets caught up in it. And he has mercy. He even tries to help Jimmy Uso back up. And I think he, what, gets hit by a low blow. And then Jimmy capitalizes on that, on Jay's remorse, on Jay being a human being, on Jay being a good brother. But I think Jay kicks out, right? Jay kicks out of whatever Jimmy does there and winds up winning the match after all. And I thought that they did set up, you know, that finish well with maybe Jay having, a, you know, a soft heart, a soft spot for his brother. He doesn't want to, you know, give him the execution. And that is what his, his downfall but he was able to recover from even that and still wind up winning the match. And I didn't really like that because I thought that you got farther with a Jimmy win because this is this is a long-standing issue and a big story between these two guys. They're not just going to wrestle at WrestleMania and be done. We're looking at probably a program here between these two guys. We're going to get another match, and the next match will probably have a stip. And I thought that Jimmy winning, especially if he tricked his brother or if he had helps from Solo Sokoa, Jimmy winning would set up a rematch a lot easier because then Jay can be like, you know, oh, this time I'm not going to, you know, have any mercy on you. This time Solo's not going to be able to do anything because I want to have a cage match with you or a Hell in the Cell match. Jay, Jimmy, Hell in the Cell might not be that bad. You know, so I thought that we were going to get a bigger match. But, you know, Jay is maybe, you know, the, the more over star. He's got the yeek thing. Fans love him. WWE wanted to give him a win here. But I would have probably put Jimmy over in this one, to be honest. So that match um, disappointed me because it felt the match itself felt underwhelming. The crowd was not as into it as I was hoping they would be. And Jay also got the win, which I didn't really like. So I lost, I got two matches in a row wrong there. And those were the only two matches I got wrong prediction wise uh, on the whole show, but wasn't really a big fan of uh, Jimmy Uso and Jay Uso. Uh, then after that, we had the big six woman tag, Jade Cargill, Bianca Belair and Naomi taking on damage control. Damage control was out first as a group, uh, they had some geishas out there throwing some rose petals on them uh, as they came to the ring. Cool looking entrance there. And then Jade and Bianca and Naomi had an interesting one. They were like raised up on, I don't know, one of those things, those scaffolds that kind of electronically raise up to paint houses or whatever, whatever they're called. Not forklifts, but what are they called? They had one of those and it was all tarped off so you couldn't see the, the thing under it raising them up. So it was basically just a big platform and they were raised up high and it lowered down to the level of the ramp, and each woman got off one at a time with their entrances. So it was, uh, I think it was Jade first, got off, then Naomi, then Bianca, which was really cool. The match was fun. You know, we got uh, everything we would expect here. Jade, I thought, looked pretty good, and she mixed it up with just about everybody there, and I had a feeling that, you know, she would be the one to, you know, be gifted the uh, the pleasure of... Uh, 
getting the pin. And we also knew that Dakota Kai was going to be the one that was going to take the pin here. And uh, Jade ended up catching her. Uh, I should say, too, Bianca uh, nailed Asuka with her braid. I thought it caught Asuka in the face, but when you watch the replay, it just kind of caught her on the shoulder. But it was loud. It was loud like it was with Sasha at WrestleMania 37. Remember that? When she whipped her in the belly and the whole crowd was like, God damn, it was kind of like that. And Asuka ate a braid shot hard. Uh, but in the end, it was Jade getting her hands on Dakota and hitting her finisher on Dakota and does the whole hand lick thing at the end. It was spectacular. And the three very powerful women stood tall and celebrated. And it was a nice moment. The match was fine. You know, I was worried about... I didn't think the match was going to be spectacular in my head. What I was envisioning was pretty much what we got. You know, I wasn't underwhelmed or overwhelmed by the match at all. It was pretty much right in line with uh, what I thought they would do. And then it was time for the Intercontinental Championship match. So WrestleMania night one really needed to finish strong here. It had been a little bit weak and underwhelming leading up to now. And now it's time for Sami Zayn and Gunther. And I loved this. This was so special. This brought a tear to my eye. You cut backstage, you see Sami Zayn basically in the parking garage. And what we're watching is Sami Zayn's special WrestleMania entrance. He's in the basically parking garage with his wife and his little son. You know, and his little son's like, Dad, are we going to be able to hear your music from out here? He's like, yeah, buddy, you're going to be able to hear it, but you're going to go out there and, and watch. And then he kisses his wife and he's like, don't have him out there. You know, I don't want him out there to see this. And the kid's like, don't worry, Daddy, I'll see you on the TV or whatever. And he kind of kisses his wife, kisses his son and walks away. And then he runs into Chad Gable. And Gable's like, look, I'm not going out there with you tonight. You got this. You got this on your own. And Sammy seemed a little bit worried and concerned and even upset that Chad Gable wasn't going to come out to the ring with him. But I'm glad that he didn't because I thought Chad Gable might turn. And I didn't know what Gable's real role in this was going to be. And what really made me realize that Sami Zayn was going to win the title was when Gable said, hey, just remember, you owe me a favor. Sweet. I know what that favor is. That favor is title shot. <laughs> That's what the favor is. So the fact that he wasn't going out there with him, he gave him, you know, you know, his support and told him you owe him a favor. I'm like, okay. And so then the camera continues to follow Sammy. Now he's going through the corridor. He's heading up through Gorilla. And right as he's about to get to Gorilla position, who's standing right in front of him? Kevin Owens. Kevin Owens just gives him the big attaboy. Go get him. Go take care of business. Get out there. The camera follows Sammy through Gorilla, through the entrance where his music plays and he comes down to the ring. And it's one of my favorite WrestleMania entrances of all time. And it cost a grand total of zero dollars and zero cents. Nobody to fly in, no band to perform, no crazy fucking pyro. You're not zip lining in. You don't have to rent a tank or a paddy wagon or a fucking low rider. Sami Zayn kissed his wife, his son, and uh, got some support from his best friend. That is the most Sami Zayn thing of all time. Sami Zayn's a very charitable guy. He seems like the type of guy like, look, WWE, if you want to spend $200,000 on my WrestleMania entrance, could I give that to charity instead and then just kiss my wife and son? I wouldn't put it all past Sami Zayn to say something like that. So I think that Sami Zayn, who we know him not only as a character, but as a person, this was the perfect WrestleMania entrance. Honestly, my favorite part of the whole show. It was because of the simplicity. The simplicity is just Sammy, wife, son, kissing him. It's confidence, you know, going out to the ring. This is it. Biggest match of my life. Everything hinges on this, you know? His coach saying, you got this on your own. His best friend saying, go take care of business. That was so awesome. That was so awesome. And I, I entered now this Intercontinental Championship match with a ton of confidence for Sami Zayn and my pick for him to win. And uh, it was a great match. They told the story we figured they would tell. You know, the, the story is Gunther's confidence and uh, Sami Zayn's lack of confidence. And so, you know, Sami has got, you know, he's got his moments in the ring and whatnot. And then it starts kicking up when Gunther uh, hits him with that first powerbomb finisher and then Sami Zayn kicks out. And you could even tell like when it happened, I'm like, no, it's not, it's not going to be the finish. It's not going to be there. And then just a few minutes after that, Sammy hits a haluva kick on Gunther. He kicks out of that. So now we have, you know, finisher kickouts on each side. And then Sammy Zayn starts to become overwhelmed. Gunther takes firm control, 
to the point where he can put Sami Zayn down and just walk around. He basically hitting his finisher and not going for the pin, walking around the ring. Then he hits him with another one, walks around the ring, gets out of the ring, goes to the outside to frog splash Sammy, but is talking to Sammy's wife, who's right there at ringside. I didn't see the kid, uh, so uh, I think they left the kid with our truth. They're hanging out backstage. So Gunther starts talking to the wife, goes up, hits Sammy with a splash, gets up, goes outside again, hits him with another splash. And I'm like, oh my God, he's going to do the WrestleMania 7 spot. Like Randy Savage hitting the five elbows on the Warrior and then he kicks out. And you know, I mean, at this point, I'm just waiting. At this point, it's inevitable. The math is done. Sammy's winning. Gunther's an idiot. And he's going to let his overconfidence cost him here. That was how it was going to play out. So then he goes out for, I think, what's going to be the third splash, right? He goes out to the top. He's jacking with uh, Sammy's wife again. And Sammy ends up getting up and coming in and hitting Gunther, who's standing on the top rope by this point, or about to stand on the top rope, with a halluva kick. So he rocks Gunther with that, I think. And then he picks him up in, like, superplex position, but comes down with a brain buster, and just fucking rocks Gunther. And now Gunther's all fucking wobbly. And he stumbles into the corner. And it's all set up. In comes Sammy, 155 miles an hour. Haluva kick to Gunther's face. Down he goes. One, two, three. Sammy Zayn becomes the new Intercontinental Champion. And it's a much different Sammy Zayn than the last time he had that title. The last time he had that title, he was a fucking goofball. You know, and now to see him where he is now, being the guy to end this historic run. This miracle win for Sami Zayn, ending Gunther's 666-day title reign is incredible. I was so happy. Julia, yeah, the, the brain buster was super sick. The way he came down, it I didn't even know what I saw. I'm like, what the fuck was that move? And then the announcers were calling it a brain buster. Uh, but it was a scary spot, and I don't think it went as intended. Uh, but the visual was good, and it looked great, and uh, wound up uh, doing Gunther in there. Hopefully he's all right. And Sami Zayn now is uh, the Intercontinental Champion going out and sharing, a, you know, a hug and a kiss with his wife. I love Sami Zayn as a wrestler, as a person, as Julia said, you know, one of the nicest guys in the business. We've uh, we've donated to his charity a couple of times here. We've bought his T-shirts and given them away. We're big fans of Sammy on this channel. So Sammy getting the win and winning the Intercontinental title. I'm glad it went that way. I'm glad that run of Gunther's is finally over. At least we know who's doing it now. So now it's time for the biggest tag team match in WrestleMania history. Roman Reigns and The Rock taking on Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins. We get the big long video package. We get the history recap. We get all of that. The first ones out are Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins. So Cody comes out first, big entrance. He comes up through the stage. Whoa, American Nightmare. The color scheme looks great on the WrestleMania sign and whatnot. He hits the ring first. Then out comes Seth Rollins. He's dressed like a fucking dickhead. He's got this crazy getup on. And it's got a long train. It's fucking wedding dress with a hat. Something's growing out of it. <laughs> I don't even know how to describe what he was wearing, but uh, I think we would be foolish to think that Seth Rollins wasn't going to come out dressed like a batshit crazy person and he was here and at least they were warm because they had to stand in the ring we had 20 minutes of entrances for this show or for this match by the way so they had to come out to the ring first and stand there while we waited for the rock and roman reigns and i was curious who was going to come out first rock or roman turned out to be rock that's the right call roman reigns is the champ he should come out last rock comes out and He's got the, uh, they've got some effects there. They do some crazy shit before his music starts. A lot of lightning bolts and effects on the screen. And then when his music starts playing, uh, they've got like an outline of the Brahma Bull logo, huge on the stage. And you see like an overhead shot of it. It starts lighting on fire. So there's like a Brahma Bull ring of fire going around. around. Oh, Lord Jesus, it's a fire. And it's all around the stage there. And then Rock comes out. He's got that Muhammad Ali belt. He's got that People's Championship that was given to him last night at the Hall of Fame by Muhammad Ali's wife. He's got it with him. So they created that whole thing. They put Muhammad Ali in the Hall of Fame just so they could get Rock a belt to carry out there. It's like his little participation trophy. It's his little feel good. My praise cup must be filled. You're the champ, Rock. It's kind of lame, isn't it? So he's out there with the belt and he comes down. He's wearing like a vest and some long pants. Some people thought he was going to wrestle in that. I'm like, no, he's going to tear that off. You can tell. Uh, and it's kind of cool that Rock has gear now because he used to just come out to the ring in his trunks. 
not with anything else on, really, uh, when he's wrestling. For promos, he does, but not for uh, matches. So him coming out like that was pretty cool. Then the Tribal Chief comes out, you know, with uh, the new Hall of Famer, uh, Paul Heyman, in tow. He's got his Hall of Fame ring on. And then we get the big introductions in the ring, by the way. Splendid job by Samantha Urban tonight. And she will also be doing the ring announcing for uh, night two tomorrow as well. She is tremendous, and Ricochet's got a keeper. Did you guys see that video of her fucking playing the flute to Razor's theme and singing? Oh, my God. I think that was at Wally Mania, right? That girl, she's got some talent, talent, talent. So we get the introductions done, and now it's time for the match. We were curious what The Rock was going to look like uh, in the ring physically. He was in amazing shape. He looked very, very... Uh, much the same as he did when we last saw him in 2013 and 2016 briefly in that match with uh, Eric Rowan. He is still in great shape. He was unbelievably cut and unbelievably huge for his age, and uh, he looked good in terms of how he was moving around in the ring. Not bad. He had about the, the amount of slowness I would expect. He's a little stiffer when taking punches. Not a lot of head snaps and stuff like there used to be, but that's just... What happens, you know, when you get older, uh, but he still looked good. He wasn't stumbling around. There was one point in the night where he delivered a low blow to Seth Rollins and he fell really badly and landed in the ropes. I was worried that something happened there, but he uh, he got up from that. But in terms of the notes that I have for this match, I don't have any because we watched it together. But once it started breaking down a little bit and the brawls were start, were starting to happen outside the ring, I think Cody and Roman started fighting on one side and Rock and Seth were fighting on the other. And that's when Rock threatens referee Chad Patton says, hey, I'm your boss. I will fire you. Don't count. So basically he's saying you're fired if you stop this match or call a disqualification or count us out. So he's forcing the referee just to let them do whatever they want. So Rock and Seth brawl into the crowd. Cody and Roman brawl up the ramp. They eventually all find themselves, you know, back in the ring at some point. A really interesting spot in the middle where there was a double pedigree spot. Cody and Seth hitting Rock and Roman with double pedigrees and almost pinned them both for the win. There were a lot of near falls in this match as well. You can never tell who the legal man was. And after, you know, the first half was a little slow and then it really picked up in the second half. That's when you start having the the tables involved. Uh, Cody rock bottomed the rock through a table, you know, Seth Rollins ate a spear through the barricade from Roman Reigns. Mama Rhodes was out there with Brandy's father. Cody Rhodes gave his weight belt when he made his entrance to his father-in-law. I uh, forgot his name, but Brandy's dad was out there with Cody's mom. Rock also had the Mama Rhodes belt. He went over and intimidated Cody's mom. Now, I was hoping they would sit Cody's mom and the Rock's mom next to each other. They weren't sat next to each other, but they weren't that far. They were basically on opposite ends of the announce table. Uh, or the announced row. Uh, Ada was on one side, and then Cody's mom was all the way over on the other. So I still think we're going to get more Rock and Cody's mom stuff tomorrow. We might even get Brandy slapping the Rock. We might get Dustin Rhodes out there. We don't know. Uh, But we had all of that. And then they set up something that we thought might happen uh, in the match. You could tell it was going to happen, too. Cody is down. He's getting his ass kicked. But the Rock is also in the ring. And they kind of give it away, because Cody and the Rock are are trying to get up at the same time. Roman is in the corner positioned to spear Cody. But Rock is on the other side of Cody. And I'm like, well, they're going to do the spot where he spears Rock. And that's exactly what happened. Cody either moved or Seth pushed him out of the way. Roman comes in with a vicious spear to Rock that the Rock takes and sells well. It was really good. And, you know, Rock uh, Rock ate that spear. Roman's got a bloody nose by this point. So I'm like, oh, there you go. That's going to be one little mistake, and I expect this to be reciprocated tomorrow. As we would see here, Roman's mistake did not cost them the match. Tomorrow, The Rock's mistake very well might. So Stone Cold Steve Austin interfering tomorrow would be great, but he might not even be needed. You know, if he comes out there, I just want him out there briefly, but not to be the the reason Cody won, maybe just out there as a little bit of backup. The real finish needs to be at the hands of Rock or Roman, you know, for maybe, you know, Rock doesn't have a move. You can't accidentally hit the people's elbow <laughs> on uh, on Roman Reigns, uh, and you can't really do it with the Rock bottom either. So I think Rock is going to have to do something with a chair, you know, Roman holding Cody, Rock comes in with a chair, Cody moves, bashes Roman, something like that is what I see happening tomorrow. 
uh, to to make up for this. But the fact that they had the spear spot, you know we're going to get a match between Roman Reigns and The Rock. That's going to happen. And they're starting to set the table. So the more they're building to tomorrow, the more all of the pieces of the puzzle are coming together. And I think for Cody to lose to Roman tomorrow would be one of the dumbest things WWE ever did. Ever did. I, I think they're poised for Cody it's Cody. It's going to be Cody tomorrow for sure. But Rock getting speared, that sets up his future match with Roman Reigns now down the line. Now, they were able to recover from this. They were even back on the same page. It didn't seem like there was even any ill feelings. What I think is going to happen is in some sort of a promo, maybe tomorrow or maybe we get some backstage thing with The Rock tomorrow for night two where he says something, you know, maybe a little passive aggressive shade throwing at Roman for what he did, something like that. But I also think Rock is going to drastically fuck up uh, tomorrow in the match. So in the end, uh, we got the outcome that I wanted. Not only did I want Rock and Roman Reigns to win, I wanted the Rock to pin Cody Rhodes. That needs to be the finish there. And I think it was Roman Reigns that put him down, put Cody down. Because one thing I didn't want to see happen is Roman pin Cody. Or Roman pin Seth. Because there's no, you know, Roman pinning Cody. I'm like, that could have worked just fine, but I'd prefer it not be that way. It just felt like the only way to do this was to have Cody lose and get pinned by The Rock. I didn't want to see anybody else get pinned other than Cody. That just plays into that adversity, plays into the stack, the deck being stacked against him, plays into the fact that he's got to be all but given up in his head. Uh, that he has no chance to win the title tomorrow, and that's when Cody is going to surprise us with some tricks of his own up his sleeve, and he'll wind up just like Brett did at WrestleMania 10, losing to Owen, winning the main event. Same thing here, getting put down by The Rock. It's a lot of the same things. It's a lot of the same parallels, uh, what Brett did at 10 and what Cody is going to do here. And it's different than what Brian did at WrestleMania 30 because Brian won both of his matches. He beat Triple H to get into that. So, uh, you know, he just suffered the post-match beatdown after the fact. So I think that, uh, you know, tomorrow the table is set for Cody Rhodes, Rock and Roman Reigns winning the main event together. Now Rock, now Roman Reigns gets to win and lose a main event of WrestleMania in the same weekend. And tomorrow he's going to break Hulk Hogan's record for the most WrestleMania main events. Is a little bit cheap because he got two done in the same weekend, maybe, but it's still the way it is. So that's going to be awesome tomorrow. I'm looking forward to night two. And I think based on what we saw in the outcome of the main event tonight, I'm feeling pretty good for that story getting finished uh, tomorrow at WrestleMania on Sunday. So